Welcome to section 30 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video we'll be discussing E. coli, which you can see right here. Just a quick heads up, this one's kind of a beast because we'll be discussing E. coli in its entirety, including all of the important strains of E. coli. This information is riddled throughout textbooks and is super high yield for step one, so it's kind of long. But hang in there, and by the end of the video, you'll be an E. coli Jedi. Okay, let's take a look at the image. This scene will take place in a collapsed coal mine. Coal sounds like E. coli, so this mine will be our symbol for the organism. Notice that we've shown some pink lights reflecting off of the ground towards the back of the image. This is to help you remember that E. coli is gram-negative. This is a gram stain of E. coli. Notice that the organism is pink or red appearing under the microscope, and is also rod-shaped. So E. coli is a gram-negative bacillus. Next, notice that we've shown a small pool of water collecting towards the bottom of the image. I guess you could say it's kind of like a bay. And just like in our other images, the bay is here to help you remember that most strains of E. coli are beta-hemolytic. This is a figure of the three types of hemolysis, which we covered in more detail in section 9, which was our video on viridans streptococci. And as you hopefully know by now, beta-hemolysis is shown right here. Now notice that we've shown some flowers off towards the side of the image. The flowers are here to help you remember that E. coli is part of the normal flora of the colon. Okay, now we've added two trapped travelers, which you can see on the right side of the image right here, as well as a green bulldozer. Notice that the two guys have been surrounded by a bunch of rocks and coal. So this green bulldozer has been hard at work trying to clear the debris and get them out. The green bulldozer, or green machine, is here to help you remember that E. coli produces a green metallic sheen on eosin methylene blue, or EMB agar. This is a figure of eosin methylene blue agar. It's a selective medium that inhibits the growth of gram-positive organisms and selects for gram-negative organisms. Notice the green color right here. The green color occurs as lactose-fermenting organisms, such as E. coli, bind to dye within the agar. If you look closely at the operator of this green machine, you can see that he has a bag full of monkey animal crackers. Let's zoom up so you can see these better. There we go. Look at those delicious animal crackers. Anyway, monkey sounds like McConkie, so we'll be using monkeys to represent McConkie agar. More specifically, we'll use the monkeys to help you remember that an organism ferments lactose and therefore it turns the McConkie agar pink. So in this image, the monkey should help you remember that E. coli is a lactose fermenter and results in a pink color on McConkie agar. This is a figure of McConkie agar, and notice that the organisms on the left right here are pink, and the organisms on the right are yellow. The pink color occurs as lactose fermenting organisms produce acid from the lactose, which lowers the pH of the agar and causes the pH indicator to turn pink. So E. coli would look like this on McConkie agar. Okay, now notice that the side of the bulldozer says speed 50 miles per hour. Seems pretty fast for a bulldozer. We've included this to the image right next to the bag of monkey animal crackers to help you remember that E. coli is a fast lactose fermenter. As the name suggests, this just means that E. coli ferments lactose faster than other microorganisms, such as Citrobacter and some serratia species. You can see that now we've added a cat on the back of the bulldozer. And just like in our other videos, this is here to help you remember that E. coli is catalase positive. This is a picture demonstrating the catalase test, which we covered in more detail in section 7, which was our video on Listeria monocytogenes. And recall that the bubbles, right here, indicate that the organism is catalase positive. Next, notice that we've shown a guy standing next to the bulldozer who's enjoying Dole Whip. Dole sounds like indole, so this should help you remember that E. coli is indole positive. This is an image of the indole test, and this test is used to determine if an organism can convert tryptophan into indole. The test is performed by growing bacteria in a sterile test tube that contains tryptophan. If the organism can convert tryptophan into indole, then the test tube will turn red. So E. coli is indole positive, which means that the test tube would appear red, as we can see right here. Okay, now that we've covered most of the lab tests associated with E. coli, let's move on to discuss other important features. In addition to the bulldozer, notice that we've shown three guys helping supply water to the trapped travelers. As you can see, they're each carrying a bucket of water. They've been dumping it into the little stream and causing a bay area to form inside of the rocks. Just like in the last several videos, these three guys are here to help you remember that E. coli utilizes a type 3 secretion system. As you can probably tell by now, this coal mine is pretty dangerous. Look at this poor guy who got smashed by big chunks of coal. He's obviously been dead for some time now because we can see some green bacterial growth starting to cover his abdomen. The bacteria on his abdomen should help you remember that E. coli can cause spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This is an infection of the ascitic fluid within the abdomen and is commonly associated with cirrhosis. 
So guy with bacteria spontaneously growing over his abdomen for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Next, notice that we've shown a pipe extending from the ceiling down to the outhouse. This flimsy pipe has been acting as a support pillar for the mine until recently when it caught on fire. The fire weakened the support of the pillar, which caused the ceiling to collapse and is responsible for this chaotic scene. The pillar idea should help you think of pili. The pipe going to the outhouse kind of resembles the kidneys, ureters, and bladder going to the urethra. The fact that the pipe is on fire should help you think of inflammation. So putting these ideas together should help you remember that E. coli has virulent pili that are associated with UTIs, cystitis, and pyelonephritis. The reason the pipe caught on fire was because of these exposed wires hanging from the ceiling. These long, thin wires resemble fimbriae, so they're here to help you remember that E. coli has virulent fimbriae, which are also associated with cystitis and pyelonephritis. Okay, now notice that we've shown a picture of a girl on the outhouse. The guys that have been working in this mine are sleazebags, so they like to hang up pictures of prostitutes on the outhouse. Prostitute sounds like prostate, so this picture of the prostitute should help you remember that E. coli causes inflammation of the prostate, or prostatitis. The coal mine accident has been so bad that the military had to get involved. As you can see, this military guy is helping oversee some rescue efforts. He needs to use the restroom, so you can see him walking right next to the outhouse. Notice that he has an ammo belt strapped across his torso. Just like in our other images, the ammo belt is here to represent amoxicillin. The fact that it's right next to the outhouse should help you remember that amoxicillin can be used to treat E. coli urinary tract infections. Next, notice that we've shown two pregnant women in the mine. When they heard about the accident, they came running to the mine because they were concerned about their husbands who work here. If you look at their heads, you can see that they're wearing helmets that have the letter K on them because they're part of what the town refers to as the care crew. They care a lot about these coal miners and are bringing food and other supplies to care for those in need. If you look closely, you can see that one of them is carrying a sack of food to give to any survivors. The sack is here to help you remember that E. coli has a polysaccharide capsule, and the K on the hat should help you remember K antigen, which is an antigen present on the capsule and can be helpful in serotyping. So girl holding a sack with a K on her hat for K antigen is present in the polysaccharide capsule. Pay special attention and notice that we've shown a pregnant woman wearing a K hat. The pregnant woman should make you think of neonates. The hat should make you think of meningitis. And the K should help you remember the K antigen. So putting all of this together should help you memorize that the serotypes of E. coli with the K antigen are commonly associated with neonatal meningitis. You can also see another pregnant lady who appears to be coughing. It looks like there's some dust getting kicked up by her feet, probably from all of the dust and debris from the mine accident. Anyway, the cough is here to help you think of pneumonia, and the fact that she's also wearing a K on her hat should help you remember that serotypes of E. coli with the K antigen are also commonly associated with pneumonia. Finally, we've shown a third pregnant woman holding up a torch in an attempt to provide extra light to those involved in the rescue efforts. The torch is here to help you remember that E. coli is a torch's infection. This just means that the mother can pass the pathogen onto the fetus, which can then cause neonatal meningitis. Okay, let's turn our attention to the right side of the image where we can see this poor guy getting shocked over here. Let's zoom up on him so you can see things better. First, notice that he has very large prominent lips and is carrying a sack. Lips sounds like lipo and the sack sounds like saccharide. So this should help you think of lipopolysaccharide. Also, there appears to be a stray wire that has come loose throughout the chaos and is now electrocuting this poor guy as he attempts to sip on his drink. Getting shocked should make you think of shock and sipping should make you think of sepsis. So together, this means septic shock. So if we combine all of these ideas, this should help you remember that E. coli has a lipopolysaccharide virulence factor that is responsible for causing septic shock. This is an image of the bacterial cell wall of gram-negative organisms, which we discussed in section 20, which was our Neisseria overview video. However, let's briefly cover it again just to be clear. You can see that we've zoomed up on this part of the cell wall right here. This is the inner membrane, and this is the outer membrane. This image shows lipopolysaccharides embedded in the outer membrane right here. This is a zoomed up picture of a lipopolysaccharide. I'm showing you this because it's actually pretty high yield to understand that lipopolysaccharides are composed of three regions, an O antigen, a core, and lipid A. Of all of these regions, lipid A is the most important to be familiar with, and this is because it's responsible for activating the immune response and is ultimately what causes septic shock. So remember, lipid A. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. So far, we've discussed general information about E. coli, but now let's move on to discuss the four strains of E. coli that you need to be familiar with for step one. First, let's begin with enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or E-H-E-C, E-H-E-C. 
This is definitely the highest yield of the four, so pay close attention here. You can see that we've added another character to the scene who appears to be completely covered in blood and coal. The coal represents E. coli, and the blood represents hemorrhagic. So together, this should make you think of enterohemorrhagic E. coli. The pool of blood around this guy should help you remember that this strain of E. coli causes bloody diarrhea. Now notice that we've shown a news reporter girl right next to the pool of blood. As you can see, she's holding a microphone that's shaped like the number one. This is here to help you remember that EHEC is the most common serotype of E. coli in the United States. Now you can see that we've shown a cup of sorbet next to the pool of blood that is getting smashed by a falling rock. Sorbet sounds like sorbitol, and the fact that the sorbet is getting destroyed should help you remember that EHEC is unique because, unlike other E. coli strains, it does not ferment sorbitol. In order to compliment the girl with the microphone, we've added a guy who appears to be recording her with a camera. So, apparently there are a news crew that has come to capture the devastating tragedy. Let's zoom up on this camera guy so you can see the details better. Notice that he's recording while simultaneously eating a hamburger with prominent lettuce seen coming out of the bun. The hamburger and the green leafy lettuce is here to help you remember that EHEC is often transmitted via undercooked meat and raw leafy vegetables. Also notice that his shirt says E. coli 0157H7. This is to help you remember that another name for EHEC is E. coli 0157H7. If we zoom out a bit more, you can see that a rock hit his camera and caused him to accidentally drop his plate. This rock actually looks a bit like some poop, or if you're feeling vulgar, shit, and is here to help you remember Shigella, or Shiga-like toxin because EHEC produces a Shiga-like toxin. Also notice that the camera says 60 minutes on the back of it. The fact that the rock is hitting the camera that says 60 minutes should help you remember that the Shiga-like toxin produced by EHEC inhibits the 60S ribosomal subunit. This in turn halts protein synthesis and results in cell death. And just again, once for your review, remember that this strain of E. coli does not ferment sorbitol, as you can see by this part of the scene right here. If we zoom all the way out, you can see that now we've added several rocks falling to the ground that resemble poop. One of them is about to crush the reporter girl, who is now shown holding three red balloons. If you look closely at the balloons, you can see that they have little tangled up knots in the string. The tangled up strings resemble the glomerulus. The red balloons resemble red blood cells. And the rock about to crush the red balloons is our symbol for the Shiga-like toxin. So all of this together should help you remember that Shiga-like toxin causes hemolytic uremic syndrome. Remember how that rock crashed into the camera and knocked the plate on the ground? Well, plate sounds like platelet, and the fact that the plate is broken should help you remember that the Shiga-like toxin causes platelet consumption, or thrombocytopenia. Now notice that we've shown another rock smashing and destroying one of the balloons. This is to help you remember that hemolytic uremic syndrome causes mechanical hemolysis, resulting in anemia. Now you can see another worker who has been crushed under the rocks. If you look closely at his helmet, it's oriented in a way that resembles a schistocyte. We've also made it a helmet because schistocytes are also sometimes referred to as helmet cells. We discussed the pathophysiology of schistocyte formation in more detail in the last video, which was our video on Shigella, so I won't cover it again. However, when you think of this guy with a helmet on, you should remember that shiga-like toxin causes microthrombi to form in blood vessels, which results in schistocytes and renal failure. This is a picture of schistocytes, which we showed in the last video, but notice that they look like little fragments of red blood cells. Finally, you can see that we've shown one rock that is on fire, and another rock that is riddled with black spots. The rock on fire represents inflammation, and the black spots on the other rock represent necrosis, because necrosis results in black dead tissue. These two rocks are here to help you remember that Shiga-like toxin causes necrosis and inflammation. Okay, that's everything you need to know about EHEC. Now let's move on to discuss enteropathogenic E. coli. To represent this, we've shown a happy, reckless kid running on a little pathway surrounded by ropes. He's so young that he doesn't really understand the seriousness of the situation, and appears to be in his own little world. Anyway, the rope pathway should make you think of pathway which sounds like enteropathogenic, pathway enteropathogenic. So this part of the image is all about enteropathogenic E. coli, and all of the information about this strain of E. coli will be completely confined by this rope pathway. Now you can see that we've shown a bunch of plants on the pathway. Let's zoom up so you can see these better. If you look closely at the plants, you can see that they resemble intestinal villi. The fact that he's smashing the plants should help you remember that enteropathogenic E. coli adheres to apical surfaces of intestinal cells, flattens villi, and prevents absorption. Also notice that the child's clothes are completely covered in mud. The mud on the child is here to help you remember that enteropathogenic E. coli causes diarrhea in children. 
Finally, notice that the child is super happy, careless, and even has a thumbs up on his shirt. This is to help you remember that this strain of E. coli does not produce a toxin, so it's not as dangerous as EHEC, for example. All right, that's everything you need to know about enteropathogenic E. coli. Now let's zoom back out and discuss enteroinvasive E. coli. To represent this strain of E. coli, notice that we've shown a vase of flowers next to a pile of coal at the edge of the mine. Together, vase and coal sound like enteroinvasive E. coli. So this little area at the edge of the image is all about enteroinvasive E. coli. Notice that now we've added a rock falling from the ceiling that resembles poop, similar to the rocks next to the reporter on the other side of the image. The poop, or shit, is here to help you remember that the clinical manifestations of enteroinvasive E. coli are similar to Shigella. So it causes an inflammatory diarrhea with blood and mucus that may be seen in the stool. To help you remember this, we've shown one rock on fire and another one with little black spots. So just like with EHEC, the rock on fire represents inflammation and the rock with black spots represents necrosis. So enteroinvasive E. coli invades the intestinal mucosa and causes inflammation and necrosis, which ultimately results in dysentery. All right, let's wrap up this video by covering enterotoxigenic E. coli. To represent this strain of E. coli, we've shown a big toxic cloud of green gas inside of the area where the travelers are trapped. So toxic cloud for enterotoxigenic E. coli. Now notice that we've added two travelers to the scene. You can tell that they're travelers because they have backpacks and are holding walking sticks. The travelers are here to help you remember that enterotoxigenic E. coli causes traveler's diarrhea. This is exactly what it sounds like diarrhea that develops in a person who travels from a resource-rich region to a resource-limited region. Notice the little puddles of water next to the feet of these travelers. Also notice that they're surrounded by a little pool of water. The water is here to help you remember that traveler's diarrhea is characterized by a watery diarrhea. Okay, now let's discuss the two toxins produced by enterotoxigenic E. coli. The first one is a heat-stable enterotoxin. Heat-stable just means that the toxin is not easily destroyed by heat. To represent this, we've added another character to the scene who appears to be staying warm with these artificial heat generators. He's not too worried like the other trapped travelers, just sitting back, staying warm, and waiting for the rescue team to come. So you could say that he's warm and stable, which is why he represents the heat stable enterotoxin produced by enterotoxigenic E. coli. The heat generators that he's using are here to help you remember the word generator, which in turn should help you remember cyclic GMP. So the heat stable enterotoxin overactivates guanylate cyclase, which results in increased levels of cyclic GMP. This decreases the ability of the intestinal mucosa to reabsorb water and salt, which in turn creates an osmotic effect within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract and contributes to the watery diarrhea present among those infected. So heat generator for increases cyclic GMP. Okay, now let's discuss the heat labile toxin. This just means that the toxin is destroyed by heat. To represent this, we've shown a guy who is an emotional wreck. He's been crushed by the rock and is stuck here, so he's much more liable to emotionally break down while waiting for the rescue team. In other words, he's emotionally labile, or heat labile. So the second toxin produced by enterotoxigenic E. coli is the heat labile enterotoxin. To help you remember the mechanism of this toxin, we've shown a tent right next to this guy. And just like in our other videos, the tent is here to help you remember cyclic AMP. So the heat labile enterotoxin increases levels of cyclic AMP. This in turn increases the intestinal secretion of chloride and water into the lumen, which creates an osmotic effect and contributes to the watery diarrhea seen in the disease. So again, enterotoxigenic E. coli overactivates adenylate cyclase, which increases the levels of cyclic AMP. Now let's talk about this wimpy fire that appears to be going out as it comes in contact with some water. Look at all that smoke rising as it gets put out. Anyway, the fire represents inflammation, so the fact that it's getting put out by water should help you remember that enterotoxigenic E. coli does not cause inflammation or invasion. Okay, remember the two bystanders over here that have been here since the beginning of the image? Let's zoom up on them so you can see them better. Look closely at their shirts. And that's right, they have very large popped collars. Collar sounds like cholera. So these two guys are here to help you remember that the watery diarrhea seen in enterotoxigenic E. coli is very similar to cholera. Whew, you made it. That's literally everything you need to know about every strain of E. coli. Just to quickly review, the toxic gas cloud and all of the information surrounding it right here represents enterotoxigenic E. coli. The vase right here represents enteroinvasive E. coli. The kid on the path over here represents enteropathogenic E. coli. And the guy laying in a bunch of blood right here represents enterohemorrhagic E. coli. All of the other information in the middle of the image is general information about E. coli. Okay, with this in mind, let's finish the video by applying this information with a question. 
A 22-year-old male presents to the emergency department due to abdominal pain and diarrhea that started yesterday. He states that he recently ate an undercooked hamburger from a restaurant and is worried he may have developed an infection. Physical examination is significant for diffuse abdominal tenderness and guaiac-positive bloody stools. Stool cultures reveal a gram-negative organism that is indole-positive and does not ferment sorbitol on sorbitol-containing McConkie agar. Additional laboratory analysis will most likely reveal which of the following. A. Thrombocytosis B. Elevated serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen C. Fragmented platelets on a peripheral blood smear or D. A positive Coombs test Okay, hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient has an enterohemorrhagic E. coli or EHEC infection. Recall that this strain of E. coli causes bloody diarrhea, hence the guaiac positive bloody stools, and is also the only strain of E. coli that does not ferment sorbitol on sorbitol-containing McConkie agar. Remember, EHEC can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, which results in renal damage. So with this in mind, the correct answer is B, elevated serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen. Recall from physiology that these are both laboratory findings that indicate renal damage. From the image, recall that the guy crushed by the rocks right here has a helmet on and is here to help you remember that EHEC causes schistocyte formation. This occurs because the shiga-like toxin produced by the organism causes microthrombi to form in blood vessels, which results in schistocyte formation and renal failure. Also recall that the sorbet getting crushed right here is here to help you remember that EHEC does not ferment sorbitol on sorbitol-containing McConkie agar. A is incorrect because HUS causes a thrombocytopenia via platelet consumption, not a thrombocytosis. C is incorrect because the platelets are not fragmented, red blood cells are. Recall that schistocytes are fragmented RBCs and that this occurs as the RBCs attempt to pass through microthrombi present in the blood vessels, so C is incorrect. D is incorrect because a positive Coombs test indicates that antibodies are responsible for the hemolyzed red blood cells. Again, the RBCs are mechanically destroyed due to microthrombi formation, not antibody-related destruction. So D is incorrect. So again, the correct answer is B, elevated serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about E. coli.